right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego as usual, blue sky in San Diego. And today I'm joined by Don Crawley, who is up in Seattle, Washington. How are you doing? I am well. Thank you, John. Glad to be here. Excellent. And Don is an award-winning IT customer service speaker and author. He's spoken to IT audiences across the world, including household names like Starbucks, Facebook, the FBI, Gap, Team Logic IT, who actually the president of that, I know, I know well myself, ah. uh, CompTIA and others. Uh, and he's the author of eight books for IT pros on topics ranging from Cisco and Linux uh, to compassionate communication and customer service. And what we're going to talk about today is how to effectively lead IT teams so that they can collaborate better and work, and work more effectively together, but ultimately uh, deliver greater customer value. Um, so, Don, leading IT teams... Is that a particular skill in itself, as opposed to leading other types of teams? I wouldn't really know about leading other types of teams, although I, I, I guess maybe I'm misspeaking a bit because I do have some experience. The, the thing with, with IT teams is that you're dealing with people who are uh, generally very, very bright. Uh, they are um, maybe a little more skeptical than the average person, um, sometimes bordering on cynical. Um, and uh, you're laughing at that, but it's you know, there's there's some truth to it. Um, oh yes. And, uh, they they also uh, are quite obviously uh, technical in nature, and and so a lot of a lot of us in IT, and I include myself in that because I came from an IT training background. Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of us got into IT because we enjoy the puzzle of figuring things out. We, we like taking things apart and breaking them and fixing them and rebuilding them and, and making them better, almost like the old line from the $6 million man, we can make him better. Yeah. And, and that's what we do. And, and our focus is, is more on the technology and less on the relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you're from a sales background, obviously, and, and selling is all about relationships. And, and when we talk about technology, it's easy to, to focus on the tech and, and forget about the importance of the relationships mm -hmm. that we have with each other, not just with our customers, but also with each other, with our coworkers. And sometimes we get a little gruff. Sometimes we, we, might, um, uh, we might think in terms of dealing with, with people in the same way that we deal with configuring a server or yeah. setting up cloud connections or something like that. And so as a manager, we need to be certain that we respect the intellect of IT people, that we respect their skepticism, uh, that we help them temper their cynicism, mm -hmm. and that we help them work with each other with different types of people and treat each each other with dignity and respect, even when we disagree. And, yeah. and, and I, I think about the fictional character Sheldon Cooper from Big Bang Theory, uh, right. who who takes it to an extreme, but mm -hmm. but um, he he's someone who who thinks it in terms of the science, the the logic, and and not in terms of the warm and fuzziness. And and I think a lot of us in IT sometimes, um, yeah, yeah we, we tend to forget about that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, for myself, yeah, I mean, I've sales, marketing, product development, I've done it all, and I have had the the privilege, shall I say, of running teams in uh, in the past that included, you know, IT and programmers and developers yes. and that. And I would concur with you. It's very, it's very different. One of the things that I think that, particularly if you're managing a, a an IT or a, or a programming team or whatever, and you're not an IT or programming person, mm -hmm. you know, you're more on maybe on the business side or on the product strategy side or whatever, is. Um, when you have to pivot or you have to change direction or you have yes. to suddenly make changes, that's a very difficult thing for IT folks, programmers. They don't like that. And sometimes it's it's a hard, I've always found that that's one of the hardest parts of leading a group like that. Yeah, you know, the, the I think it was Simon Sinek who said that without the why, the how and the yeah. what don't matter. And, mm -hmm. and I, I think he's absolutely right about that. And that, that really is the key um, when you need to pivot, you better be ready to explain why 
And I, I suspect that that would also apply to, to non-technical teams, that, that we need to understand the benefit, the, the reason why we're doing this, the, 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 the purpose behind it, as opposed to just, you know, here's the, here's the road plan, now go execute it. And I think that's, yeah. that's universal. I don't think that's limited just to IT teams. Yeah, but I think to your point, I think you sometimes may have to go a little bit deeper on the why, maybe, and you have to maybe be a little bit more persuasive, because as you said, um, everything, when everything is in neat rows and entirely logical and stuff, and sometimes, you know, these changes in direction don't, in, don't come across entirely as logical sometimes, and maybe sometimes they're... <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I found. But it's interesting. I will. Uh, and I think it's it's very, very, as you say, intelligent and, and creative people in their own yes. way. Right. Yes, but very yes. different. I, I just give you a good example of where one guy I knew who, when I'm originally from Ireland and when we were working in the in Silicon Valley during the dot com era, we had. A building in Redwood City was actually the former Next Computers. Um, oh, bill, right. um, Joe, um, what's his name? Sorry, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is old <laughs> place, right? Yeah, I went through every every IT guy there. Um, Steve Jobs, exactly. And it had it overlooked the marina, right? Mm. It was phenomenal, beautiful, right? Beautiful building. One of the top uh, 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 programmers came over from Ireland, and he had an office that looked out over the marina. First thing he did was blacken out all the windows. <laughs> Of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> my, you know, my wife gets after me. We we live in, in a beautiful place in Seattle. We have a gorgeous garden, and I pretty much keep the shades down. So. Yeah. So, but I, I just use that as an example, as if yeah. you're dealing with very different type of of, mm -hmm. of personalities. So, how do you? I mean, because sometimes then. People would argue that, as you said, you know, that that IT teams and programs like they work, it's very logical, like the Sheldons. Mm -hmm. the, sometimes the customer gets lost in the mix, right? Yes. And they make assumptions or say, well, they should be able to, they should understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a problem. But I, I, I would hasten to uh, add, John, that, that I don't think that's a problem limited just to IT people. Mm -hmm. that, no, I would agree. That, we all get into this this mindset of uh, I'm an expert on this. I mean, we're not saying these words, but but I'm an expert on this. Why don't you understand this very simple concept? And and one of the examples that I use in my keynote speeches and in my training is it's like when we go to the doctor's office and the doctor says, you know, okay, Don, uh, yeah, you may need to make some lifestyle changes, you know. Uh, lose a few pounds, maybe, you know, not drink quite as much bourbon and, you know, maybe <laughs> give up those cigars and, and, you know, I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and then and, you go, and then you go, yeah, apart from that, is there anything else? Or, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Maybe, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what's interesting is the doctor doesn't sigh. He doesn't roll his eyes. He doesn't mm -hmm. make condescending remarks. You don't hear him say idiot under his breath. Yeah. Uh, he, he or she uh, simply takes care of me. And and it's the same thing when I go to my accountant. My accountant is this wonderful person who, I, I, the last person in the world you want to have balance at your checkbook is me. I, that's just not my thing. <laughs> and so every every quarter I go to my accountant and I make, the, yeah, I've taken my QuickBooks back up to my business and I make the mm -hmm. same stupid mistakes and I ask the same stupid questions. And each quarter he and his staff take care of me. They smile, they answer my questions, they correct my mistakes. And I said to him one time, I said, Dave, when I leave, you guys roll your eyes and sigh, don't you? He says, no, we don't. I said, it's okay. He says, no. He <laughs> said, our job is to take care of you so you don't have to be an expert on accounting and tax law. And I think that oftentimes the complaints that we hear about technical support people acting in a condescending way toward end users are because the tech support person doesn't get that for, for them, computers and digital systems and, and automation systems are a first language, but you could have somebody who's very, very bright who doesn't get computers and who struggles with them. And, and so we need to take that same attitude that the doctor takes with us when we don't give up our cigars or brandy or whatever, mm -hmm. or the, the, the accountant takes with us when we make the same stupid mistakes or the mechanic when we forget to change our oil and realize that, that this, is, this is about giving each other grace. And it's about mm -hmm. lifting each other up 
in spite of the fact that maybe we don't understand each other. And there was a French sociologist named Emile Durkheim who, who suggested what, what's called the functional theory of sociology. And in the functional theory of sociology, you have all of these different groups within a society. You have people who are professors, who are doctors, who are lawyers, who are maintenance people, uh, construction workers, railroad engineers, and so on. And everybody is good at what they do so that everybody else doesn't have to be good outside their area of expertise, that we all work together to lift up a functioning society. And, and that's, I think that's the thing that sometimes we forget, that it takes mm. all kinds and, and that, that you may not be an expert on computers and you may struggle with remembering how to format a document or you know, whatever it is, that my job as an IT person is to remember how to do that so, so that I can lift you up and help you do your job better. And the, uh, the other thing that I'll say to, to IT groups, again, in a keynote or in training, is that, that our jobs are not about technology. Our jobs are about helping our end users do their jobs more creatively, productively, and efficiently, sometimes in spite of their best efforts to keep that from happening. Mm -hmm. So I, I really think that's what it's all about. Yeah, and I, I like that because I think, but that's what it is. That's what it's all about. Yeah, no, no, I, yeah, that, that is what it's all about. And I like your, um, uh, you said about your your idea of like compassionate communication because I think that's kind of what you're talking about here. Yes. and I also think it's it's like one thing we forget sometimes, as you said, when we're dealing with if you're an expert in something and you're dealing with somebody who's not an expert in that. Um, obviously, sometimes you forget that they may be experts in other things that you're not. Right. But you forget how, particularly as adults, um, if we're not an expert in something and we have to reach out to somebody else, we already feel a little defensive. Great we don't feel point. good. We mm -hmm. hate being in that kind of situation anyway. So we're already in a space that if you start to be condescending, we're already beaten down. You're just making yes. it 10 times worse. You're pouring salt in the wound. That's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a, a wonderful book by Simon Baron Cohen. It's got a creepy title. It's called The Science of Evil. Um, but mm -hmm. he studied uh, how people could be so cruel to other people. He, his parents uh, went through the Holocaust, and so he studied the, right. the, the way that, that that happened. And what he discovered, he, he's a psychologist, and what he discovered was that in the presence of empathy, there can be no evil. And, mm -hmm. and so it, it struck me that even though, hopefully we're not dealing with that type of, of nastiness, that, that type of evil, but still, in the presence of empathy, we will automatically move toward helping our fellow humans to, to have a better experience in, in their life and their job. And, and so empathy really is the key to, to, uh, to certainly to customer service, to dealing with, yeah. with your staff. You know, you were, we started this talking about leadership and, and now yeah. in the presence of COVID-19, there was a wonderful blog post by IT Nation recently on LinkedIn where they talked about how to lead uh, in the age of COVID-19. And the key point that IT Nation was making is that you've got to lead with empathy. And, and yeah. I think that you need to do that regardless, but especially today with, with what's going on with people having to work from home. And, you know, you and I were joking about dogs, you know, my hound dog would come in and start howling and, and, you know, our people have kids who demand attention yeah. and yeah. That, that we need to empathize with the people that work for us, as well as the people for whom we work, as well as our peers to try to imagine what their experience is like. And then to think about how can I help make their experience better? And that it's, yeah, it's and just I, a mutual I, back scratch. And I, I agree completely. And I think um, empathy is always important. But I think as you're, you're, you rightly point out right now, it's even more so because yes. people are, are in different situations mm -hmm. and people deal with situations differently yes. and their circumstances are different. You know, for, you know, I may, I may be fortunate. We, we have run a virtual company, pretty much a larger virtual company for six or seven years. And we did that strategically. So this hasn't really been, um, you know, there's been business as usual for us and we're set up that way. But if I maybe was, you know, didn't have a dedicated um, home office, if I had young children who are now at home running around, that's yes. a very, that would be a very different reality for yes, me. Indeed. And therefore I would need some level of understanding and empathy from my, my, my colleagues, my, my management or whatever. So maybe I would have to reorganize how I work a little bit more. And I think that's the key is that I think everybody, if everybody adopted 
that level of empathy and carried it out of this crisis and just into into general we we could actually create a more collaborative a more win-win yes. world for everybody yeah the, this concept of of the the uh lone ranger is is really kind of silly the, the mm -hmm. very rarely does that work that 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 we are collaborative species we're pack animals and and yeah. and one of the things that's been difficult for me uh it, just as a solopreneur which i've been for years mm -hmm. is accepting the fact that that maybe i need some help and that maybe right. i need i need to reach out and listen to what other people have to say and to uh to listen to ideas and to sol to solicit input um and to to consider how my actions affect others as well as how theirs affect me and and uh, i think that in any crisis there can be some good and, mm -hmm. and I, I don't want to minimize the devastating impact of COVID-19 and the coronavirus on, on families and people worldwide. However, in, in the face of the evil that is coronavirus and COVID-19, some of the good that can come out is that maybe we can start reaching to each other and lending a hand and, and, and finding ways to, to lift each other up. Yeah, and no, I, I agree. And I think also, and then I think the other part is that we just need to acknowledge that we live in an ever ever increasingly complex world and and it's and it's complex in business and there is no way you can be an expert in everything you can't even be you can't even in in there are lots of things where you can't even be mediocre in because you just there are too many things so you're you have to reach out and work with other people who are experts yes. in that area it's just a it's just a fact you're going to be very miserable and very, and unsuccessful if you don't learn how to do that you know, it's interesting that you say that. I, I see parallels between the world of IT and the world of medicine. Um, mm -hmm. And my best friend from high school is a physician, and and we often talk about <clears throat> about the specialization that's taking place in medicine, where yeah. you could have a physician who is an expert on uh, uh, pick uh, cardiology, um, and and you wouldn't want to talk to them about uh, uh, about uh, bone issues, for example. Yeah. And, and even though they may have gone through some of the same basic training, mm -hmm. the the the, the uh, field of specializations has has grown so much, and it's the same thing in IT. It used to be that you know if you were, if you could manage a server, you could do some basic coding, and you know you could do it. today. You know, we've got DBAs, we've got cloud administrators, yeah. we've got you know, the mobile app uh, specialists. And, and uh, so it has become a very, very specialized world. And we're so much more dependent upon our fellow humans to help us do our jobs in the same way that they're dependent upon us to lift them up as well. Yeah, which then goes back to neatly to where we started. And the, because of that, then you really need to understand how to manage and get the best out of people. Because now the chances are you're managing a lot of different people with very varied skill sets with different areas of expertise. And that's even more that's even more complicated because you've as we started off saying at the beginning, you've got bright people who are very, very good at something that they do. And you have to find some way of working them all together. You have to find some way of working them all together and also of earning their respect. Mm -hmm. um, and because if, if you don't do that, they'll eat you alive. And yeah. you may not even know what happened to you. Because, <laughs> again, these are very, very, some of these yeah. are very smart people. And, yeah. and, and I, I've seen IT managers who came from a different background. Mm -hmm. and, and they were able to succeed working with IT teams. And I've also seen people who came from an IT background promoted into manager positions who weren't able to succeed. And yeah. the difference, I, the difference seems to be, I haven't done any you know, formal research on it, but just anecdotally, the, the difference seems to be that the people who are promoted from outside who are successful as managers, even though they may not know IT, they spend more time asking questions than making mm. statements. Yeah. And, and the people who succeed least of all are the ones who are rarely asking questions, rarely soliciting input, but instead, you know, offering their opinions. Um, yeah. Just uh, again, an anecdotal observation. No, no, and, and I think, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I remember when I when I did, you know, manage some teams of programmers. I said they always love when you just say, "Oh, come on, it's only a bit of code. How hard can that be?"
<laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So remember what I said about eating you alive? Yeah. <laughs> That's where they start taking their first nibbles. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. Listen, Don, this has been fantastic. All of Don's information will be in his contributor bio. But before we go, Don, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Uh, well, as you mentioned in, in your wonderful introduction, I'm a professional speaker and author. I've written eight books for IT people. Uh, the one that uh, is most popular is called The Compassionate Geek, and it's available on Amazon since you're allowing me to shamelessly yeah. plug myself, I will. Uh, and, and I also speak to IT groups, and we've pivoted to working in a virtual environment. We have on-demand training through our CompassionateGeek.com website, and then we also do virtual uh, training and keynote speaking using Zoom or whatever platform people want. Um, again, uh, to adapt to the, the uh, coronavirus and the, the age of COVID. So I uh, would love to have a chance to work with you. Yeah, and I would and I would certainly encourage people, uh, now's not the time to back off things like training. I know the I know the reflex is always on cost savings or cost cutting and you know sure. or stop training and all that. I think you have to you need to give yourself every advantage to come out of this uh out of this uh, crisis and into the into the recovery and the world is going to be a different place. We don't know quite how it's some of it will be the same, some of it will be different. We don't know what that looks like. So I think you have to upskill yourself and give yourself every advantage. So I would encourage people to check out what Don does. And uh, as I said, I, I think now is probably one of the best times to train people and train people virtually because being out of a lot of people being out of the office, they probably have a little bit of extra time that they may not have had before that they're not using for commuting and all of that good stuff. And so now is a good time to do some virtual training. You know, the, the key uh, is to avoid becoming a commodity. And, yep. and the people who are commodities are probably going to end up being out of business in today's world. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so the, the, the success factor that will make the difference for your organization, for any organization, is the relationships that we build, the human relationships that we build. Yeah. And that's how you avoid becoming a commodity. And I think that's how you survive and, and not only survive, but prosper in, in tough times like this. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Um, absolutely agree, 100%. Uh, listen, Don, this has been great. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeline of CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah.